So we'll go ahead and get started. So um, hi, my name is Ilan Rubinovich. I'm the uh, I'm with uh, with Datadog. Uh, today we'll be chatting a little bit about postmortems, um, how to some tips for doing them effectively within your IT organizations. Although a lot of the lessons apply for uh, you know, I've been chatting with folks in the audience as we're waiting to get started. And a lot of them tend to apply to to really any part. Uh, it, any endeavor you are you are attempting. I know I uh, was chat, chat, chatting with Jeremy in the back there about postmortems was really in conference organizing. Uh, get to do those a lot there as well. Um, so uh, there, ho hopefully a lot of these apply regardless of uh, if you're a, 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 if you own some sort of production service or not. Um, hopefully some of these lessons can can work for you uh, in other places. So um, so again, Elon, uh, I'm with with Datadog. We're on director of technical community. I get to engage with the open source community on our various um, various open source projects. We have a, a, you know open source agent that takes plugins. We have uh, various SDKs and libraries, lots of different pieces. So I get to chat with folks about um, expanding that community, getting them, getting folks engaged to build, build and contribute more, as well as to capture um, interesting stories around monitoring and metrics. Uh, my background is uh, primarily in web operations and you know, in monitoring systems, automating uh, automation tools. Uh, worked at places like uh, Uyala and Edmunds.com, uh, building building monitoring systems, often failing, and then uh, you know finding things like Datadog to to save the day. Um, uh, in addition to that, I organize a number of open source community events. Uh, scale will be uh, scale is uh, you know scale one is one of them down down in Los Angeles. Again, run a lot of po we run an annual postmortem for those events as well. Um, so uh, you know, Datadog and what we do. I'll, I'll keep the Datadog sort of advertisement very short, but uh, hopefully you guys all had a chance to meet with us down in the booth and expo floor at some point or another. Uh, we're a hosted monitoring solution. We pick up, uh, we, we 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 collect metrics and events from all of your applications and infrastructure. That's everything from your containers and your schedulers like Kubernetes and Mesos and and Docker and the like uh, to cloud providers to uh, you know open source things like Redis and Cassandra and MySQL. You know all the way up and down, uh, down your stack. The idea is to give you some insightful dashboards, some intelligent alerts that don't give you that pager fatigue we all hate. Um, and then, you know, and as well as the, uh, collecting all that data in a way that you can use them for these types of postmortems, as well as making database decisions in your environment. Um, we're collecting about a trillion metrics a day at this point to give you, uh, you know, to give you a sense of, of, of our scale. Um, and we're always looking to hire more folks to work on our open source projects, as well as to help make other open source projects more monitorable. So maybe they have them ex ex extract more metrics or what have you from them. So if you're looking for an opportunity, um, you know, datadog.com slash careers, we'd be happy to, or I'm happy to chat with folks afterwards. Um, so postmortems, uh, we'll sort of jive into the actual, actual talk itself. Um, so this is, this is sort of a quick quote from, the, from an internal the Datadog developer guide, uh, sort of chatting about, uh, discussing some of the challenges as you build these large distributed systems. And, and this applies to more than just Datadog. Um, the, monitoring systems that we, the, the monitoring systems that we engage with these days are distributed and complex more so than ever. We've got schedulers moving the pieces out from underneath us and you know, moving them from one server to the next, maybe from one region to the next. We've got auto-scaling going on with our cloud environments. We've got crazy end-tier architectures with SOA and REST APIs and like, all of the different jargon that you hear as you wander around these tech conferences. And all the pieces interact in ways that are much more complex than they might have been 10 years ago when you had a very clear maybe three-tier architecture or a static website um, that you interacted with. There's, there's lots more pieces to go that, that, that can break or interact in, in unintentional ways. Um, so you know, the problems that we work on are often really hard. They don't have necessarily have obvious solutions. And so we need to have sort of hone our skills so that we know how to troubleshoot, know how to investigate, uh, and then learn, know how to learn from our failures afterwards so that we don't repeat the same mistakes. Uh, because there's, there's enough new mistakes to make. Uh, we don't need to repeat the old ones. Um, so yeah, encountering problems is part of is going to be part of your job, especially in an operations environment, whether that be again for a conference or a uh, you know a large scale uh, monitoring system or you know whatever else you might be working on. So I, I guess before I keep going, I'm just from curiosity, how many folks in the room are running some type of postmortem uh, after after their failures? Cool. How about after your what you might call a success? I don't. You might call that a retrospective instead, but I mean it's similar idea, right? So um, you know, uh, you know, as, as we go through these troubleshooting exercises, it's important. You know, as I said, it's important that we're embracing and learning from these failures. Um, you know, this is a, a quote from Henry Ford, and you know, as he says, the only mistake, um, 
the only mistake is the, the one from which we learn nothing. Uh, you know, it's, uh, never lose an opportunity to, to learn or to better yourself as a result of, of an incident or an outage or a failure. Um, it's an opportunity to fix that technical debt you might have missed in the past and you knew you had to address. It might be an opportunity to fix some, some communication challenges with your team. It might be an opportunity to just be more successful in the thing you already did really well. Um, you know, how do we repeat that? So, um, you know, it's important to come back and look at, um, look at how we did, whether or not it was, a, whether or not we would classify it as a complete failure or not. Um, so, so what do we mean by postmortem? Um, it's, it's a discussion of an event held soon after it occurred, um, especially in order to, if it was a failure, and especially in order to determine why. Um, some people feel that postmortem terms are a little negative, so again, like I said, retrospectives or reviews are, are also fine to call them. Um, but we, again, the goal is to learn, uh, is that we rep prevent those repeated failures. Um, so along the same lines, the other thing I like to do in a lot of my talks is just kind of give the focus area. And one of the things that I'd like to define really quickly is DevOps. And how many folks would, claim, would, have, would say they engage in some sort of whatever they define the term DevOps to mean? Okay, lots of hands. Uh, so uh, these two guys, the picture on screen, John, uh, John Willis and Damon Edwards, um, they, they, gave, they, they coined this term, the, this acronym CAMS, Culture Automation Metrics and Sharing, um, as the sort of the four pillars of DevOps. And so as I start talks, I kind of like, like to sort of steer into which of those four corners we're going to focus on. Um, to give you a sense, culture is this idea that we're, um, you know, we're working together, we're seeing the problem as the enemy, not each other. We're, work, uh, you know, we're looking to collaborate. Uh, automation being the idea of building, you know, building uh, scaling with code rather than with people. Uh, metrics being measuring what we're doing and so that we know if we're getting better or worse. And then sharing this sort of loop, uh, this idea that we're going to take our learnings back and help each other uh, be more successful in the future. Um, so we're mostly going to skip over automation, but I, I do like to point out this is this is sort of a, an example I like to I like to point out quite frequently is there's not a lot of automation here. But they're repeatedly building barns here for like 200 years without very many failures. And it's, a lot of it comes down to culture. Like it's, I mean, I, I want to say there's no automation, but really, yeah, I guess pulleys and ropes are, are automation compared to trying to do this by hand. But the sense is, you know, we don't need to argue about our puppet or our bash or our data dog versus our Nagios. Let's first argue about, let, let, let's first get on the same page as to what we want to do as a team, because then we can do incredible things like, like we see here. Um, again, the, 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 the reason they're able to be successful is they're approaching this collaboratively. Um, and many hands make lighter work, and they're, they're not, there's not a lot of infighting as to like who gets to hold this rope. Uh, are we using a rope made out of like camel hair versus a rope made out of some, some synthetic twine? Like, what are we doing? They're, they're, just, they're just getting it done. Um, it, they're also not fighting over, uh, you know, do, you need, do I need specialists or do I need generalists with, you know, in, my, in my barn raising DevOps? Um, you know, they actually, in some cases, they have folks, you know, not everybody off the street gets to do the joisting or the connect, you know, or, the, or, or her, her working with certain pulleys. They, they do have specializations there as well. So it, no matter what your flavor of DevOps, there's, there's lessons to be learned here. Um, but yeah, once you're successful, that, get that crane, build yourself, you know, build yourself a bunch of barns really fast because um, you'll still be communicating, right? There's that guy, in the, the guy in that crane has a walkie-talkie there somewhere, and he's letting somebody know that he's about to drop a big container cause, so they don't get crushed. Um, we all know people are our bottleneck, and it's not really the technology, right? Like we, it's our, uh, the, not really the ideas or the technology. We just we all have open headcount. I assume I, I don't. I don't know about you guys, but I can't hire people fast enough to fill the roles I have. Um, it's not. That that's my biggest challenge in general. So again, we're going to focus on sort of this idea of of culture and sharing. Um, that's that's those are sort of the the, the pillars that would generally cover this. Um, again, postmortems in general would be under under sharing and the idea of learning. Uh, across our teams and across our organization, um, blameless postmortems we'll get to it a little bit later. Fall a little bit, will we'll fall into the into the culture bucket and and, and working together rather than against each other. Um, so what do I mean by blameless postmortems? It's you know it's not like uh, it's it's a term that was coined by John Alspa. He's got some great writings on it. I've got some links later in the resources. Um, but what does it mean to be blameless, right? You know, somebody made a mistake, you still want to be able to have a conversation about them. It's not like, oops, I spilled the milk. Um, that's it, we're done. Or you don't confess your sins and all of a sudden you're absolved because you did it in a postmortem. Like, if there are mistakes, we need to address them, we need to make them better, because otherwise we're not actually continuously improving, and that was the whole point of this. Um, so no, having a blameless postmortem actually means that you know, the engineers who have actions have contributed to the accident um, or the issue can, can give a detailed account of what actions they took, 
why they observed, you know, what they observed, what made them take those actions, um, you know, what was their context that led led to the mistakes they made or the or the outages that they encountered, uh, maybe what some of the assumptions they made about the business or about the technology, um, and their understanding of the timeline of events as they occurred, um, and the most important part is. Um, you know, and where the word blameless comes, or maybe blame aware, some people are calling in these days. It's the key that we need, they need to be able to have to do this without, you know, the fear of the pitchforks coming out. Um, they can't fear, people can't fear punishment or retribution. It can't be, I, you know, I made the mistake, I fat fingered something, I took down the website. I can't fear that when I admit that, I'm going to lose my job. When it, we need to maybe go back and see why was I able to do that? Why did I make that mistake? Why did I think those were the right actions to take? So again, put away the pitchforks. It should never be about about the blame here. This is where the culture piece, you know, comes around. Uh, I think on first, uh, people you, when you when you re, when you first join a team, you're going to initially think you, you, you're going to you need to see you're going to observe the culture around you. And if you're in a situation where there's a lot of infighting and you feel like every if I admit a mistake, I'm going to get fired, then you're not going to be you're not going to be the most successful. In, in what you're attempting to do, because you're going to fear that failure. And more importantly, you're going to fear explaining why you failed that and then learning from it. Um, I would say that's, if you're in an organization where that's, that's a problem for you, then you know, there's, there's a serious culture problem that you need to address first before you can get into the, you know, into, into the, into the practice of holding these postmortems effectively. Because otherwise, you're going to get in a room, you're going to start lobbing these uh, blame grenades around, and whoever, has, you know, whoever caught the most of them, they're the ones that are going to lose, and they're going to lose their job, and they're going to move on. Um, but I mean, a lot of this just comes down to that to that culture bit. Um, I can't give you culture, but I can sort of point you in the direction of of what I feel is important. Point you to some resources, and hopefully, as an organization, you can you guys can agree that you want to work together, not not against each other. And it, it's a challenge. I've been in organizations on both ends of the spectrum, and there's a middle ground as always. So, um, yeah, sure. Um, so again, John Alspaugh has done a lot of writing on blameless postmortems. There's also a great book by. Uh, Dave Zwickbach uh, called uh, The Human Side of Postmortems uh, by O'Reilly. Uh, he can, you know, these are both great resources to dive in if you, wanted to, if you want to read the book on these. The slides will be up online later, so don't, don't feel like you have to take pictures of slides or, um, write, or jot down bit.ly links real quick. Um, so, you know, talking about it all is great, but um, how do we... How do we measure what we're doing, and how do we measure if we're being successful, and how do we uh, use the, that to inform our postmortems? Uh, and the key part, of course, is, is metrics. That's the that was you know the third of four four, four pillars uh, we talked about earlier in, the, in DevOps. Um, and so, I mean, really going down, be, be, if, if you don't have metrics, whether it be about monitoring your systems or about monitoring your teams or monitoring your response times to those incidents, you really don't have a sense of whether or not you're getting better or worse. Uh, or, or staying the same. And it's sort of like driving down the street with your headlights off or your wipers off in the rain. Uh, you're doing it blind. It's not responsible. Let's start, let, let's start collecting that data. Um, uh, this, guy on, this guy on Twitter, Honest Updates, hilarious. You should follow him. Uh, you know, he's, <laughs> these, are sort of some, he, he, these are some tweets that sort of reinforce this point. Um, a postmortem that would require us knowing, you know, uh, Having some idea of what just happened, uh, our metric collection failed during what you're calling an incident. So as far as we're concerned, it didn't happen. Uh, these are th this, he's got like a dozen of these a day. So he's uh, but he but he's always spot on as to what, what these are. I mean, how many of you guys have had incidents where the only action item in your postmortem is I promise next time I'll have some monitoring in place so that I catch it and it doesn't happen a third time? Are, are, is that a question or are you raising your hand and admitting? Admitting. Cool. You, usually people are kind of sheepish under the under the table. I, but yeah, um, so you know, collecting data is cheap. I mean, 10 terabytes of S3 storage, uh, you know, is with a put every three seconds is like $315 a month. Like, stop pretending like we need to throw away data. We we don't collect as much of it as you can. Um, if you don't, it's going to be expensive to generate again later. Like going back and trying to recreate the events of a security incident or a technical outage or what you said or didn't say on a control call, nearly impossible. So it's very expensive when you don't have it, but cheap, cheap to collect it when you do. So, um, you know, um, you know, Track Research said had a survey of 300 companies. They they said the average revenue loss for an hour of downtime was twenty one twenty one thousand dollars. 
Um, you know, Amazon has a similar, a Amazon's numbers are a bit higher, as you can imagine. If Amazon.com goes down, I think they, they said it's about one hundred and seventeen dollars to $118,000 um, for an hour of down, you know, for, uh, sorry, for, for a one minute outage. Um, so, you know, these are, th your organization may be not at that scale, but there's definitely a cost, whether it's for trust within your organization or for, uh, uh, or to your customers. And, you know, so collecting this information so that you can identify what happened and when is, is key. Um, so how do we recommend doing it? Well, there's, uh, there's we, our first step we would say is to categorize your, your metrics from your organization and from your team into three, three, three buckets. Um, the first being work metrics, the second being resources, and the last being events. Um, and you know, to give you a sense, work metrics are the things that your customers come to you for. So it's an API call, it's a car, it's a, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a widget that you sell. It's the thing that they will wake up in the middle of the night, they, they will wake you up in the middle of the night to complain about. Um, it's not necessarily all of the things behind it. So those are what we would call work metrics. Those are the things you really have incidents about. Um, they're the things that impact your SLAs, et cetera. Um, resources are the things that go into it, and events are things that provide context. Um, so in this example, you know, we're, we're a donut factory. Um, work metrics are the things that are indicating the sort of the top level health of our systems. Um, they're letting us measure its useful outputs. So the type, four types that we kind of, that we, we break that into are throughput, that's requests per second. Maybe how many donut orders have I gotten today? How many people are sitting at the, in line at the register? Um, success being how many of those are, you know, in the case of a web server, it might be 200 responses. In the case of donuts, it's, you know, how many donuts showed up with all of the holes intact or not intact as it may need to be, had the glaze they needed to have, et cetera. Errors being maybe how many tasted bad I had to throw out or the, you know, the ones that came out a little clunky. Uh, performance being, you know, the, the response time. So when somebody walked up to my register and ordered a, ordered a donut, how long did it take before they got it? Um, or your API call, how long did it take before we responded? Um, resource metrics are all the things that go into it. So again, if we continue down this, uh, this bakery or donut store um, example, um, these are the things that are, uh, th th these are the things that, that go into making those donuts. So how much, you know, how much flour do I have? Uh, am I, you know, how many of the ovens am I using? How many of the sort of the conveyor belts am I using there? Um, saturation being how much, how much, que you know, how much queued work do I have? Uh, and availability being, you know, do I have enough of those resources that, that are the resources that I need available? Maybe it's the baking staff, maybe it's the, the pieces, what have you. So um, these are really important for investigating as we're diagnosing the problems and responding to the incidents, as well as for building our timelines afterwards. Um, without them, we can't really tell a complete story. Um, events, on the other hand, are things that are, they're things that happen to us. They're, they're sort of dis the discrete occurrences of something that would provide a context as to what happened. So if you know, Homer here is being force fed a bunch of donuts, we gotta keep up with the devil's orders. Um, that's a big, that, that we, gotta, we gotta generate a ton of donuts right now. That might cause a large backlog, that might cause an increase of orders, it changes the way we interact with it. Uh, if you're doing a code deployment, you've now changed the behavior of your environment. You wanna be able to know what's happening and when. Again, these are, the, are contexts. They explain why something occurred in your, in your organization uh, or to your metrics. And that's, this, again, these are important for telling your story about what changed in, about why things changed in your system's behavior or in its output, its useful output. Um, so these three things together, I mean, in general, there's a whole other talk about which ones to alert on. The, the short of it is work metrics are the things you want to wake up on, use the rest of the, you know, these events and, and, and resources to, to troubleshoot it, and then again to build your postmortems afterwards as to how you could have done better. Um, so what are qualities of a good metric? Well, uh, they need to be well understood. You should be able to quickly look at it and you know, determine how how the metric or event was captured, what it represents, um, should be named well, so you know what <laughs> you know you know what it means, um, and they should be common to everybody involved. If you use the if you use different terminology or if you use different units of measure across your teams, you're going to have sort of that Mars orbiter disaster where things crash into planets because you thought feet and somebody else thought meters and you know mismatch. Um, they should be granular. So if you're collecting metrics too infrequently um, or you're taking averages. Uh, you're going to find that a lot of times your, your, your metrics are lies. Uh, the average request time across the entire Super Bowl after your ad, you know, is probably not, or sorry, the average number of requests during the Super Bowl across the day of the Super Bowl, probably not that high. The average request during the 15 minutes that, like, in that 15 minute window around the ad break where your ad played, probably pretty high. So, you know, you need to be granular enough that you're getting all this data. Um, and that's, again, in your monitoring systems or in other, other data captures, ca capture locations that you might be interacting with. Um, don't want to lose important behavior over, over averaging out. 
Um, make sure that you're, tag you're, you're sort of providing enough uh, facets on your metrics as you're doing this. Um, you want to be able to look at it by region or by data center or by task or by, by person and figure out how these all play together. Um, make sure that you can slice and dice, drill down, get more, you know, in, 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 and look at this from the angle that's most important to you. Um, keep them around for a while. Uh, you know, a lot of times we have incidents where it slowly hurt us. Uh, the response times got worse with every release that we did until one day we broke our, breached our SLA and we didn't know why. It's sort of uh, very, very slow death there or, or incident. Um, so have, keeping these around for a while is important so that we can do you know, seasonal cycles. We can figure out if we're better this year versus last year, especially on big events. So you come to LinuxCon with a booth, you sell a ton of what have you. You want to make sure that your site can handle that next year. Um, so again, the idea is that you start figure out what your work metrics are, figure out what your resources are, and sort of recurse. Um, the most important thing as you're, a team, as you're working on your team is knowing what you're responsible for. So you're responsible for your work metric. If I have a web application and my job is to return API calls or to return donuts, that's my, um, that's my work metric. That's what I measure my success on. But I should know who my resources are, which might be a data tier down below me or a bag of flour that I need from, you know, from the supply guy. Um, and those resources are in turn his work metrics. And his resources will be you know, the people that supplied the bits that he needed to provide that upstream. So if we all know what our work metrics are and what our resource metrics are and where, where those point, we build this sort of uh, uh, this dependency graph that's quite useful to us as we're doing troubleshooting and, 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 planning our, and figuring out our post modems. So again, you're going to, as you identify an incident, you'll examine work metrics, dig into those resources, uh, figure out what changed in terms of events, and you know, keep going. So um, the next lesson I'd say around postmortems that's key is, um, is knowing when to have them. <laughs> so uh, your primary goal during the actual incident that you're investigating needs to be restoring your service. Don't start postmorteming post during the incident. So if somebody's here taking notes about like, how I messed up in this talk, and I'm sure, there's a, I'm sure there's a list, I'm happy to take it later, don't come up right now to start telling me about it, because I still got to finish the talk. I still got to finish the work product that we've got in front of us. I will come back to it later. We will have a conversation. Um, it's okay to take those notes and investigation points for later, but don't derail the actual investigation you know, with, 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 um, with your postmorteming. Um, trying to con you know, conduct it during the incident is only going to severely distract our, us from actually getting, getting our jobs done and, and getting back online. So you know, as we're collecting data for these postmortems now that the event is over, who should be doing it? Well, um, it's easy to say everyone, but you know, you got to... Um, kind of to use an analogy, uh, my, my colleague Jason Yee likes to say that the responders are like the police. Uh, the identifiers are like the, they're the witnesses. They're maybe the people that, that, that saw the outage happen and let you know. That could be a monitoring system, but it could be a person. Um, affected users might be, might be the victims of, of the crime. Um, and so you want them all involved. Um, you know, a detective or a cop is never, or that traffic cop is never going to just talk to the one guy that was behind the wheel in the car. He's going to talk to everybody that was involved and figure out what was going on as they're doing it. It should be the same case as you're building your postmortem, uh, whether you're the coroner or the report person that doing, that's doing the report, you know, the report on it. So, um, but but what are we trying to collect? Um, well, we want to collect again, the, as, as John Oswald was saying, we want to try to collect all of the information that will let us know whether or not we made the right choices during the incident, not just why the incident occurred. So what did people do? Why did they do it? Why did they think it was the right thing to do? Uh, did, you know, uh, and how do those all connect? Uh, it's important that we figure out what the false indicators are and identify those, how, you know, how we got to the wrong conclusions that may have extended the outage or that may have caused it to begin with. Um, it's important to make sure that we're not asking uh, yes or no questions because that's not, you, know, you can't really get the nuance there. Uh, you want to be, we want to do more, more open questions. And often the question is, you know, people like to talk about the five whys, uh, you know, from the Toyota lessons, um, from Toyota's lessons within their factories. How is also quite important, so, <laughs> and what, so uh, you want to kind of dive into those as well, into those other aspects as well. Um, but the key is that, you know, we're, we're all, we're not looking to blame any individual as we're doing this. They want, we need to be safe, feel safe as they're saying this. And we want to share the blame sort of as a team or, or, about, or, or evade it entirely. Um, the other thing is technical issues often don't have, uh, they often have non-technical causes. 
Um, so that may be, again, maybe a, a, a human misunderstanding. It may be an event outside of the context of your actual applications or services. Uh, there's lots of, lots of aspects to this that may, um, that, that may, be, that may not be um, something related to code that may have changed. You know, so a good example, as a real world, uh, back in 2014, there's a cloud provider, provider joint They're, that tend to be big and tend to do a lot in the container space. I'm sure you guys have heard of them. Um, they experienced a human-induced outage, uh, shut down their entire data center in the East Coast, made all the headlines. Um, they wrote a great postmortem. I've got a link in, in the docs explaining what happened. Uh, and the short answer is, sysadmin fat fingered a, a command, shut down all the servers rather than shutting down a subset of new servers. Um, not, <laughs> we've all been there, uh, you know, in our career where we've done a thing by mistake. Um, so, uh, but one thing that's important, but one thing you'll note here is if you look at that postmortem that I linked here, um, nowhere in the action items will you see something, you will you see blame or pitchforks. You're not going to see an action item of fire that guy, he's careless. Uh, what you'll see is um, the why, you know, which is a review of the context of what led the engineer to run the command. He thought he was doing a, he thought he was doing a maintenance on, on some of their controllers. The how uh, being, you know, a review of the, of the tooling failure that allowed it to, that mistake to happen. Um, again, in this case, there was no validation on the command. So when he didn't enter the con he didn't enter the scoping it expected, it just shut everything down. Um, uh, and the what you know is what's the next action to fix. So these are all these are all key to have in, in your postmortem. And in this case, again, it was a tool that should have had a little bit more validation, check that you actually provided the arguments it expected rather than just blindly doing what it was told. Um, and the way they determined what they determined the failure, the, the, the lessons were actually not 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 educating the engineer, not chastising the engineer. They, they call out in all, the, you know, all their blogs and uh, postmortems on this. That, like, the guy already felt bad. Like, he hit the command. He was already beating himself up before he could stop the command from running. Um, there's not much, there's no better, there, there, there's, no, there, there's no win in making him feel worse. Um, and you can't prevent typos. We're all going to make mistakes. You didn't sleep last night. You didn't get your coffee. Uh, you miss, you know, you, you, you literally just fat fingered something because you made a mistake as you were typing. These mistakes are going to happen. You can't prevent them. So we have to make tools that uh, you know, prevent us from doing that. And that, that's very clear in this postmortem. That's everything that they focused on, is how to make sure that this will not happen again from a tooling perspective, not necessarily a human perspective. Um, so um, let people that are involved in the postmortems write down their story sort of in, in more than just bullet points. Um, this helps them kind of clear their mind, clear their thoughts and get to a uh, Make sure that what they're what they're what they're thinking is is actually what they mean to say. Uh, it turns out that a lot of times when you write something down, it you start to crystallize uh, crystallize the actual message that you're looking to give rather than just um, rather than just limiting it to a couple words. You know, this is not Twitter. We're not looking for 144 characters. We're looking to get the real story as to what happened. Um, you know, there's a Chinese proverb, or depending on who you ask, it was possibly a 1950s advertisement for a, for a car dealership. But uh, you know, pictures worth a thousand, worth 10,000 words. Um, you want to make sure that you're enriching your story with timeline in your timelines with graphs and snapshots of, of what happened from your monitoring tools. Um, so that might be time series graphs from something like Datadog or Ganglia or you know one of the many other time series monitoring tools that are out there. Um, Pull all those metrics together and use those to tell the story. Um, caption them with what you think happened at what time. Overlay events on top of them so you know where you know where things are going. Um, as an aside, uh, Datadog has a has a new notebook feature that kind of lets you snip portions of your graphs and drop them into a timeline to tell, to tell a story. Uh, happy to demo that for somebody at some point. Uh, but you know, any even if you have a real notebook and you're just jotting down the things and you know, pasting the graphs on top of them, that's that's fine as well. Um, they're really going to help provide that context to your story. Um, so when do we want to do this? Well, as soon as you can, again, without doing it in the middle of the incident. Um, you know, memory, uh, memory drops off exponentially at, 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 at exponentially after about 20 minutes. Um, and it just keeps, you, you keep forgetting how it's going. There's a, there's a I saw a talk by, um, by uh, a training, I went to a training event by, by somebody, by, by J. Paul Reed, uh, Who's a consultant in sort of this DevOps space, and he played a talk. He played a snippet for us at the start of the session of, a, of an airplane of, of, a, of an airplane landing where there was a failure, and he told us, "Pay attention to what's happening here." 
At the, end of the, at the end of the one hour session, he asked us to write down the timeline of events of what happened. Not a single one person in the room got it right. And we were told to pay attention to it. So in your incident, you're gonna have these same problems if you don't remember, what, if you don't write these things down quickly. It's very easy to fall into the trap of, man, I'm tired today, I'll do it tomorrow. Oh, I'm on vac oh, then now Bob's on vacation, we'll do it when he gets back. And next thing you know, another incident arises, um, you, know, you push it back again, now you've repeated, now, now you've pushed this out days, weeks, months, and you actually don't remember what you did or why. I mean, you have the metrics, but you don't have a lot of the context of what's going on. Um, so getting in, the, getting in the habit of doing this as soon as possible is key. Uh, may, don't, don't let yourself slip on, on it. Um, make sure that you're gather, as you're gathering the data, you're not putting people on, in an awkward position. Um, you know, people are obviously stressed, they've just been dealing with a crisis. <laughs> putting them on the spot and sort of uh, having it be an acquisition is not ideal. Uh, you know, you want to be sensitive to that, but, you know, get at that data. Uh, if they're stressed or they're concerned, as we said earlier, they're not necessarily going to give you their honest view of what happened. They're going to try to protect themselves. Um, sleep deprivation, you know, contributes to memory, uh, memory loss. So if you've been waking up at 3 in the morning every night to deal with these outages, you're probably not going to remember exactly what happened either. Um, and, you know, burnout sort of falls into that as well. Um, biases are also a key thing. Um, people, even when they want to give you the, act, the, the, the sort of correct view of what happened, it's very easy, to, very easy to find yourself in a situation where you unintentionally are giving a biased response. So maybe you have some, maybe you're doing, maybe, you know, these are just a couple of, of, of the biases and there's a ton, ton more, uh, there's, a, you know, there's, there's probably, I think I was looking at, looking at the types of biases that might be really here in Wikipedia and there's like a 200, a 200 item list of different types of, 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 of biases that, that they've, have been identified in humans. Uh, you know, there's anchoring, this is the ten, basically we rely too heavily on, um, on a single piece of information. So we're sure it's this one thing, we're over here looking and we've totally missed this big set of issues over here that we could have learned from. Um, hindsight, um, things, we think things that are, things are obvious or evident now um, that they weren't have been at the time. It's this 2020 hindsight, uh, you know, being a, being a Monday morning quarterback, like, of course we should have done that. That would have been obvious at the time, and it turns out maybe it wasn't from the data. So looking for that, those are great places to, those are places to, it's, a, it's important to identify that bias and make sure that we're addressing it in our tooling so that we're collecting the right data. Um, uh, availability bias, um, you sort of, we recall, uh, we overestimate sort of the value of events that we can easily recall, but not, you know, underestimate the ones of the value of the events that we can't recall. Again, the reason why it's important to take good notes as you're doing this. Um, it doesn't, uh, the bandwagon effect, or, you know, is this other one where, like, we think because one of our colleagues said that it must have been this memory leak that caused outage, we all want to go focus on the memory leak because we're going to join the bandwagon rather than investigating all the aspects. So, um, you know, let's, let's talk a little bit about how we do a lot of this at Datadog. Uh, and, you know, I, I think this, we, we think this is particularly effective. I, I hope, uh, you know, these will be, hopefully this aligns with some of what you guys are doing and, and some of the ways that uh, your organizations can run these similar postmortems. Um, so, uh, one of the things that's important is that, is having these postmortems occur on a regular basis means that people are accustomed to them. It's not, even if it's, they don't have to happen for, you know, P0, the world stopped outages only. They can happen for, for smaller things, as we said earlier. And so having them regularly lets you build up the good habits for this. It lets us, uh, it lets us learn from our peers. It lets us avoid the cultural issue that we were asked about before. Well, what, what if people feel like they're afraid of this? Well, if they have one every week and they see that nobody's losing their jobs over the fact that they admitted a mistake, um, they're, not gonna, they're not gonna see that be, uh, they're gonna quickly adapt to that culture. Um, so the way we do it is uh, when a postmortem is compiled, it's emailed company-wide. Uh, I mean, primarily engineering is looking at it, but also product teams and, and, and other parts of the organization. You want to be fairly open with these. This is the part about sharing. I realize not every organization can do this, but uh, you know, sometimes there's compliance reasons where maybe you need to be a little bit more circumspect as to what occurred. But ideally, you want to share as much as you can because people can't learn without it, and they're going to make the same mistake you did otherwise. Um, the other thing we, we, we do is we'll schedule a recurring review meeting. So once a month, the whole team gets together and we look at all of you know, the leads on any given postmortem. We'll go back and report to the whole company in person what they, you know, what they believed happened, some of the practices that we learned, some of the action items that came out of it, and how we stand, you know, where we stand on delivering those. Um, and that means that 
people get to actually have a conversation with that person as well and ask questions about maybe things that we missed in the, in the core postmortem team as we were developing those postmortems. Um, so what, you know, what do these tend to contain from, from our, uh, the primary thing is impact on our customers. We always want to keep, you know, keep, keep our eye on the business goals and make sure that we're addressing our customers' needs. Otherwise, as a company, what's the point in, what's the point in, 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 in doing what we do? So we try to describe what happened at a very high level, provide a very short but specific summary. Think of it like an abstract in a scientific paper. Uh, it doesn't need to go into all the details. Um, you want to make sure that you're covering the impact on the customers, the severity of the outage, uh, what it impacted, and ultimately what it took to resolve the outage. But again, this is a summary. This is not intended to be um, the actual scientific paper. This is that abstract at the front. Um, so here's an example. We had an incident in March um, where uh, we, had, we had an incident in March that resulted in some, some impact to our customers. Uh, we were fairly open about this postmortem. There's a link to it, to it afterwards. We feel as a data, <laughs> as a company called Datadog that focuses on monitoring and teaches people to have postmortems, we felt it's, we often feel we feel it's important to make those available to our to our customers. Um, so in this case, uh, we had two you know two sets of applications. The, the names don't the code names don't particularly matter, um, but they were they were blocked on accessing a cache that they needed. It resulted in some you know an increase of latency and 500 errors. Our monitoring system caught it. You can really you can see we we, we brought Pingdom data into Datadog. We were looking at that graph over time. Yes, we do use Datadog to monitor Datadog. Um, you can see there's not very, there's no events overlaid on this graph, so there weren't any changes on our end in this particular moment. So we don't know, there was, it wasn't a thing that we did that caused it to occur, at least in this particular case, uh, in this particular view. Um, everything seemed normal except that some cache nodes seemed overloaded. Um, so you can see, you can see that's you know at the top here we've got a quick summary. It explains what we think happened, or what, what, what we believe happened, how it impacted our customers, um, and what we did to resolve it, as well as the, the length of that outage. Um, you know, we then have different additional sections where we're talking about the impact. So we go into a little bit more details. We talk about customers had, you know, they might have seen a down page intermittently as they were trying to access the site. Um, you know, we considered it a major outage. We classified it as such. We have SLAs to adhere to. We want to make sure that our customers know whether or not we're breaching them. Um, and then we talked about how we how we solved the problem. So uh, we replaced you know we replaced some of the cache nodes with larger cache nodes, and you know, lo and behold, the problem went away. Um, so you know how was this uh, how was this detected? Is the next is the next question you want to ask yourself? Did you have all the tools in place to figure this out so that you could catch it the next time? Um, you know, metrics and monitors are how we improve our response time. Right? We don't we we tend to focus on mean time to resolution, not mean time, not necessarily mean time between failures. Right, you want to make sure that you're, when you catch these failures are going to happen, you just want to make sure that when you catch them, you can catch them quickly and resolve them quickly. So this section kind of helps you understand where we can improve. Did we have the right monitors in place to know what was going on? Uh, did we have a metric that showed that outage? Uh, was there a monitor for that? You know, was there a monitor there? Uh, and you know, how long did it take for us to declare it? And so you can use an, another snippet from that same postmortem. Um, you know, we we had multiple metrics that caught it. Here's links to the graphs that show it. Um, was there a monitor on metric? Yep, and we got alerted on it almost immediately. Uh, you know, took us less than three minutes from start to, 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 to setting out the notification, updating our status pages. It's pretty solid. And so you can see we've got graphs all across the board here showing, showing the metrics around this. Um, so what did we respond? It's gonna be, so the next section being how do we respond? This is sort of part three of our template. Um, we, look, we list who was involved, who owned the incident, who drove it to resolution. Uh, we quickly grab archives from our chat, chat service. We use Slack. Um, I don't, if you use IRC or Jabber or HipChat or uh, you know, Mattermost, doesn't really matter. You pick the tool, but um, that you want to capture wherever your control call was occurring. Uh, we talk about what went well, what didn't go well. We outline that here. So in this particular case, um, you know, names have been, in general have been changed to protect the innocent or the guilty, whichever it may be. Uh, in a lot of these things, but um, we talk about who responded. Again, you see links to here. We have uh, graphs tagged to things, and, and a quick timeline. Um, you know, again, chat ops archives. This is like if you're not adopting chat ops within your organization, I encourage you to go back and look at what this is. I know my initial reaction was, I don't want to do all of this in chat. That's absurd. It turns out, being able to do all of your work in an open environment like this means that people are not wondering what happened when. Uh, if you can run your arc, if you can run your commands directly from your chat. Service, so like we actually do a lot of our deployments by talking to a bot in our chat room. 
there's no question as to who clicked what link when. It, it's all right there, and it's happening in the order that it occurred in. So everybody has visibility during the incident, as well as after the incident is what it occurred. Um, having it all logged is, is fantastic for, for getting those control calls done. If you're doing control calls by phone, that's also good. Just make sure you have a scribe that's writing down what's going on during the incident so you can remember later. Um, but it makes it super easy to build timelines. Um, you know, tracking learning as we go. We talked about not, you know, not instance not the time to run the postmortem. Uh, it's fine to track the learnings as you're doing it, though. So one of the things that we do is we'll drop a message in the chat room and we'll just have the hashtag postmortem or or lesson or lesson tagged on it. People know not time to debate it right now. I may or may not agree, but at least when we come back to the chat archives later, there's a thing that we should have thought about and we should talk about a little bit further. Um, but. Yep, uh, and then finally, why did it happen? This is like the technical and the degree of, you know, when you start to dive into, uh, you know, what caused the incident, um, especially where uh, you're sort of writing prose at this point instead of bullet points. Uh, um, uh, our CTO, Alexi, has a great presentation where he actually does this postmortem that I mentioned here. There's some links, uh, there's some links here on the slide, but where he actually does this presentation and, and at, at a meetup, ran the actual postmortem in front of folks so they could see what was going on. I recommend you take a look at that. Um, but the, the, the TLDR is we looked at this. We, this, this took a while to actually find the root cause of. We, you know, we had to narrow it down to Redis in the network. We had to narrow it down. We then had to dig into CPU. We had to dig into like, the maximum capacity of EC2 instances. We then had to dig in. You know, this, is not a, this was not a short investigation. Um, but there was a lot. We managed to capture it all and build a, a very accurate timeline using all those graphs and the metrics we had collected, which was quite helpful in preventing it from occurring in the future, adjusting our alerts, et cetera. There's a lot of circumstantial evidence in many of these cases that will point to you into the entirely wrong direction. And it's easy to say, that looks like the easy one. Check and go back to your day job and then just have the incident occur again. So, uh, um, so the most important part of all of this is how do we prevent it from happening again? Uh, make sure that you're filing, check, you know, we use GitHub and Trello to track our work. You guys, you know, you might use Jira, you might use ServiceNow, you might use some other, you might use a note, an actual physical notebook. Make sure that you've, you're creating these issues and these cards and these, these plans and, and, and tracking them through to completion. Otherwise, what was the point in this entire exercise? Um, if there's any related issues that you discovered, you know, make sure that you're, you're noting those as well so that they can be tracked. Um, but be honest with yourself. It should be legitimate. You know, the... I've been in postmortems with action item as well. We should just retire that app. Well, you've been trying to retire that app for five years, and you've not done it yet. That's not a next. That's not an immediate postmortem action item. That's maybe an aspirational goal. That doesn't belong in this postmortem. Um, but you want to break them into these three categories. Now, being we're going to drop everything we're doing right now and work on on, on addressing that issue. Those often tend to be things that where you know the incident's going to happen again tomorrow if you don't address it. Um, next, being you know maybe we'll do it in the next sprint or two, uh, whatever your sprint cycles look like. Later, it's the closest aspirational I might get, like maybe in the next month or two. If it's outside of that scope, it's likely not a fit for your postmortem action items, and maybe things to track in some sort of a quarterly plan or, or long-term plan for what your team needs to do. But um, they're, not, they're not directly actionable. Your team's not going to be focusing on these, and it's going to go into this backlog that sort of festers and, and, and grows endlessly like a queue. Um, make sure your business owners are part of these conversations and discussions as you're having this. They shouldn't feel blindsided when you add a bunch of things in now and next, and all of a sudden now all the features they wanted are not, are not coming through. Um, you need to make sure that we're having that conversation um, with a wider organization. Um, so here's some examples. Um, we added some, you know, we had some tickets here to uh, add some tweaks on kernel and, you know, kernel and Redis tuning, links to not only the tickets, but also to the commits once those commits were done so that people could come back and see the learnings from this. Um, we added monitors on, you know, TCP retransmits and, and error rates on that particular application. Um, but even there, we still got to have a conversation about it here. Somebody else popped in later on and said, I don't know that I agree with that being the right monitor. We should maybe look at something different. Um, and so again, these continue to be a conversation even, even after the incident has occurred. We want to, it's, you know, sort of a continuous learning exercise. So a quick recap. Uh, we want to look for things. We want to cover what happened, how we reacted to it, how we responded and what, you know, what, why it happened and then what we're gonna do next. Um, and again, always focus on that impact to customers. Fixing things for the sake of fixing things doesn't get you any wins. Um, so some additional resources. Uh, we talked about John Allspot earlier. He's got some great writings on his blog and on the Etsy blog about it. There's some uh, short links for that there. 
Uh, J. Paul Reed, you know, we talked earlier about, bl I mentioned blameless postmortem. Somebody, I think somebody was asking about, like, how do you not blame, you know, blame, blame people for the failures? Uh, j you know, uh, J. Paul Reed will argue that you should be having blame aware postmortems where it's okay to, to identify who was at fault, but not necessarily, you know, lob those grenades at each other. Make sure that we're understanding how to work together in that. Um, he's got some great writings there. And then, of course, Alexi's written, uh, our CTO has written that, uh, a series of posts called Monitoring 101, where he describes how to monitor your environment. Um, and so with that, uh, you know, we can start the postmortem on this particular talk. I'm happy to answer any questions you might have about my decisions or what caused me to write it, uh, and we can go from there. But thanks for sticking with me through the end of, uh, end of LinuxCon. Uh, you guys are definitely dedicated for being here at the 4.30 hour rather than at the bar. Um, so thanks. Are the slides already on? The slides are not yet up, but... I will upload them here in the next couple minutes. To the, uh, Linux. the Linux con site. I'll put them on um, on all the slide share slide, you know, speaker deck ones, but also on the Linux con site. Sure, uh, in the front row here, and we'll kind of work backwards. Are, are you aware of anyone that's using uh, Savix in terms of feeding data Datadog? Uh, we have a Zabbix integration that will take data from data that will take data into Datadog. We have one for Nagios. We have one for New Relic. Um, we tend to be happy to take. We we want we want to bring all of your metrics in one place. Oh uh, yeah, I mean we have over 150 150 to 200 integrations with various open source projects. If that could be a talk in and of itself, although it'd be more of an advertisement. So I I try not to. Um, but Zabbix is one way. I mean I you could also use Datadog to replace that entirely. But you know if you have things in place, it's a great way to feed you know feed data from other monitoring systems. Okay, well, I'm happy to chat with afterwards if you'd like to chat about Datadog more. Uh, somebody else had questions? Yeah. <coughs> so for me, like, most of you far, because all the time you have a deep dive. Like, how far you have to dig to actually solve the issue? I might not, like, want to, if I, tomorrow my uh, communication between two server bugs, okay, if the network is down. If I'm not, like, did that much, whatever is happening in a week, some point I might, why every week I have the same issue. Mm. And the really hard part about it is how do you aggregate all in post mortem to analyze, okay, well, this issue has been five times, like they did it the nine, they could last six yep. months. And do you make like your life, okay, like these six different issues, they're all one way. This is yep. the communication with the server, which is always dropping, and you need to fix that issue, so all yours are. Yeah, so I mean, I think there's, there's, a couple, there's a couple things packed in that question. Um, the first is, um, you know, maybe the first is how do you, so you, you asked how do you identify patterns across this postmortems? Well, that's where, well, one of the things that we're, we do is every, again, every, about, uh, every, every month we get together and we have a review as an engineering, as, a, as an entire engineering team of all of our postmortems. And you can very quickly, you know, as each individual presents them, you're like, wait, that, I didn't realize that. Maybe I didn't realize that happened multiple times, or maybe I didn't think these things were connected and now I see it. Um, you know, in terms of, Sometimes the issue is, you know, sometimes the issue isn't that that one network link between the two hosts was down, but rather why did I care? That's another one to look at, right? Maybe, maybe we need to look at why there was a, what, why an issue in that particular window could have impacted me rather than, you know, rather than being distributed across multiple, multiple points of failure. A lot of this determine, you know, relates to your own architecture and your own environment. We should, you know, you can, you want to focus on, on there, but that's, that's, Making yourself more resilient to the failures is probably a better is probably a better use of your time often than, than investigating the individual you know system failures. Thank you. Um, sure. Uh, I think that was you. Yeah. yeah. Sure. So, so within, within Datadog, if you built it, you own it for the most part. So uh, when I say operations, that's, I mean, that's, a, that's a bucket of resources within your, within, your, within, your, within your engineering team on how to deal with it. So you know, if, you build the, if you build the API that takes in metrics, that's, you own that. Um, that was similarly the case where I, worked at, you know, where I worked at Uyala. But just because I own something that has an outage doesn't mean that somebody else downstream doesn't have to do post-mortem work so that I don't have that outage again. Um, and that's where my, you know, my, my, my point about involving business owners is important. So 
Uh, I think one of the biggest mistakes folks make as they, as they tackle incident reviews and postmortems in general is they don't include their product managers. Uh, at the end of the day, everybody make, wants to make the right decision by the company, whether it's the product manager, the ops guy, the developer, you know, every role, right? That's, I think that's really the lesson of DevOps is we want to be working together as a team rather than working in these, in these silos that have competing locally optimized goals. Uh, and so if you include your product manager, who's sort of the CEO of your little, of your, of your application, he wants, to, he wants to make his service, his feature, his, you know, his segment of the company profitable. He wants it to be successful, he wants customers to use it. He's gonna help you prioritize the true, important, net, like immediate action items at the front above feature work. And if he has to make a compromise, you're gonna to get to have a conversation about why that compromise is important. Um, you know, it's the decisions you make when you're a five person startup, you're gonna be very different than what you make when you have an established service that's, that's existing. And so you know, maybe, the, maybe addressing the immediate outage is not nearly as important as getting that, that uh, you know, getting a feature out the door that will enable the company to exist tomorrow. And so every organization has, you know, has a different tolerance to these risks and to these failures. And so you have to have that conversation with the business team, not just within a technical team. Uh, was there another question? I thought I saw a hand, but looks like not. Awesome. Well, I uh, hope you all enjoyed the talk. Uh, happy to chat with folks afterwards about Datadog or postmortems or anything else. Uh, I'm Ira Binovich on Twitter. You saw that, I think, at the beginning of the deck. Feel free to tweet at me if you have questions. Um, but otherwise, enjoy the gala tonight, and hope I see you at some of the parties here at LinuxCon. Thanks. Thank you.